Well, thanks very much to everyone for being here so promptly so early on a Sunday morning, but I think we are going to have a really good panel to make sure that it's, it's worthwhile. Um, I, I, I know that uh, we spoke a little bit yesterday. The Nadon reference came up in some of our discussions, and possibly just as Benny's remarks. I can't, I, I can't recall uh, specifically, but I, it, it obviously has been one of the, the bigger Supreme Court cases of the year. It's actually not, it's only a little bit more than a year ago that the Supreme Court of Canada uh, rejected Stephen Harper's Quebec nominee, Mark Nadon, and as you all know, much controversy ensued about the decision, about the Quebec requirement, about phone calls, about most of the players, some of them on the bench, some of them not. Uh, so there's certainly a lot to talk about. Um, we, have, we have a great panel today. We have Andrew Coyne, who is, many of you know, is a political columnist. He appears at CBC on Ad Issue. Um, and Andrew has uh, written a little bit about the Nadon decision, but we'll get to hear a lot more in depth today. Uh, and as Chris Mamathan is a uh, professor of law at the University of Ottawa, <laughs> She publishes and lectures uh, frequently on the Supreme Court. She does a really great job of making Supreme Court cases and all legal cases really accessible to uh, not only lawyers, but also a general audience. So we're very, very pleased to have both of you here today. As yesterday, we're just going to do it informally and turn it over to the panelists, but a little bit different from yesterday because we have two, di two very starkly differing viewpoints, or at least more defined. Um, what we're going to do this time is, is Andrew and Chris are each going to talk for 10 to 15 minutes minutes, and then we're going to give them each a chance to do a little bit of rebuttal for about five minutes before opening it up to questions. Okay, and without further ado, here's Andrew. Uh, so perhaps I should explain my, my presence here uh, as a non-lawyer at a uh, <coughs> legal conference. Uh, the original uh, co-speaker was supposed to be uh, Grant Huscroft, a professor of law at the University of Western Ontario. Uh, however, he sadly cannot be with us as he was tragically uh, appointed to the Ontario Court of Appeal. However, I think I can at least uh, tee things up, as, if you will, uh, so that Professor Mathen can tee off, if you were. Uh, the history of this particular uh, ill-fated appointment uh, need not be reviewed in great depth. Uh, we can remember it as a sort of a series of unpleasant highlights. Uh, the legal challenges from a Toronto lawyer and from the government of Quebec disputing his eligibility as a member of the Federal Court of Appeal to represent Quebec in the court, the quarantining of the new appointee pending resolution of the case, even barring him from entering the Supreme Court building, the hurried insertion somewhere in an omnibus budget bill of legislation clarifying the eligibility issue, the unprecedented spectacle of Mr. Dadon's prospective colleagues having to decide whether he was fit to join them, capped by that extraordinary fiasco of the Prime Minister appearing, to, or the Prime Minister's office at any rate, appearing to suggest the Chief Justice had improperly intervened in the appointment, a suggestion roundly and in my view rightly rejected in the legal community, not least after it emerged that if I recall correctly, all of the shortlist the government had sent the Commons Committee reviewing the appointment came from the federal court, that same contentious uh, criteria. The appointment was to many observers an odd one from the start, uh, he's un undoubtedly a competent judge, but not a particularly distinguished uh, in his uh, ju ju uh, jurisprudence. Known primarily for his expertise in maritime law, at 64, semi-retired, uh, and as a member of the federal court, as a, certainly as a matter of politics, if nothing else, it was bound to raise eyebrows, especially in the Quebec bar, given that he had last practiced law in the province uh, 20 years before. So there were lots of reasons not to have appointed him. Lots of reasons why it was not necessarily the best and most well-considered uh, choice. And they certainly knew, they, the Prime Minister's office, certainly knew that his legality was at least likely to be some kind of an issue, which is why they sought the opinion of legal scholars, including Professor Peter Hogg and former Justices of the Supreme Court, Ian Binney and Louise Chiron, all of whom indicated they were at peace with it. Should they have sailed so close to the wind for so unpromising a candidate? Uh, probably not, but that's a political matter and not a legal one, and it's to the legal issues that I'd like to turn now. And there, it seems to me, are, are three issues. Um, one, whether it was lawful under the relevant statute. Secondly, whether it was supported by the historical record and legislative record. And third, and this is perhaps not so much a legal issue, but uh, the consequences of this ruling, especially for federal court judges from Quebec. Uh, 
Strictly speaking, of course, the court was not asked in the reference to judge, rule on Judge Nadone's appointment per se, but rather on the broader question of eligibility it raised. Is it sufficient, that is, for a judge to have been a member of the Quebec Bar in the past, as in Judge Nadon's case, or must he be one at the time of his appointment? The relevant statute, of course, is the Supreme Court Act, Sections 5 and 6. Section 5 of the Act would seem quite straightforward on this point. Quote, any person, it reads, may be appointed a judge who is or has been a judge of a superior, superior court of a province, or a barrister or advocate of at least 10 years standing at the bar of a province. Is or has been a barrister or advocate of at least 10 years standing. It would seem clear enough, and it would certainly seem to let in Judge Nadon, a partner with Fask and Martin O. Walker in Montreal for nearly two decades. But then section six would seem to add a wrinkle to this general eligibility criterion. At least three of the judges it stipulates shall be appointed from among the judges of the Court of Appeal or of the Superior Court of the Province of Quebec or from among the advocates of that province. Again, clear enough, at least three of the judges must be from Quebec. The purpose, it seems to me, is equally clear to ensure the court has a certain number of judges with experiences in the province's distinctive civil law system. Or rather, that was what it was about until the court's majority started in on it. In those two words in section six, from among, the majority discerned an exception to the general eligibility rule in section five. While in every other province, both current and former judges or advocates are eligible, it ruled, in Quebec, and Quebec alone, they must be active currently. So a section that was intended to ensure the inclusion of three of the judges for Quebec was thus converted to the altogether different purpose of excluding a whole category of jurists from Quebec. Now, of course, it's possible to read from among the advocates of that province to mean from among the current advocates from that province. But if that was what Parliament meant, you'd think it would have said so, not hidden it in the text for future judges to discover. It's especially implausible when the passage is seen in context, reading sections five and six together. Section five, after all, not only says both current and former advocates are, are eligible, it speaks of any person, not any person outside Quebec. It says a province, not a province other than Quebec. Indeed, as Justice Michael Moldaver notes in his dissent, the principle of currency applied in isolation leads to an absurdity. To be appointed as a judge from Quebec, it would be enough to have practiced law in the province for a single day as long as you were currently practicing. That's obviously not on, and the majority agrees. It says the 10-year minimum should apply. But where does it get that idea? From section five, the same section that allows, if you'll forgive me, has-beens on the court. With respect, Judge Moldaver writes in his dissent, this amounts to cherry picking. Choosing from section five only those aspects of it are, that are convenient and jettisoning those that are not is a principle of statutory interpretation heretofore unknown. Well, that's the statute, but then let's look at sort of the historical context. It seems to me the majority's interpretation cannot even appeal to the legislative record. The principle of reserving a number of the judges in the Supreme Court to Quebec was indeed part of the original legislative bargain that created the court and the majority rightly quotes a raft of sources on how critical this was to its perceived legitimacy in the province. It quotes a number of sources of this effect. Tellingly, however, it provides no similar citations in support of the claim that appointments to the court from Quebec are and always have been restricted to current members of the bar or bench or were ever intended to be. It doesn't because it can't. As Judge Moldaver again notes, there is nothing in historical debates that suggests any such thing. In other words, the court made it up, as it so often does in these kinds of cases. To compound the offense, it then forbade the federal government from passing legislation clarifying uh, that both current and, former current, bar, current and former bar members are eligible on the grounds that such a change in law would amount to a change in the court's composition and thus require an amendment to the Constitution. But it wouldn't change the law, only the court's own freshly minted interpretation of it. 
I'm not ordinarily one to cry judicial activism, God knows, but this surely fits the description. But now on to the consequences. Far beyond the negation of Judge Nadal's appointment or the souring of relations between the Prime Minister's office and the court, uh, there are a, a raft of other consequences. One immediate one is, uh, we, as we've seen, the abrupt termination of the nascent process of parliamentary review of Supreme Court appointments. Now, I don't blame the court for this so much as the, the government apparently in a fit of pique at this result, but neither Nadal's replacement, Clément Gascon, uh, nor Suzanne Coté, the most recent pick, were chosen with any prior public scrutiny, whatever. More seriously, the precedent has now been established that members of the federal court from Quebec, and only from Quebec, are now ineligible for the nation's highest court. And since I am not a lawyer or a judge or a law professor or a, a member of the federal court, I'm going to quote uh, from the recent speech to the Barreau du Québec by Marc Noel, Chief Justice of the Federal Court of Appeal, who would know a thing or three on some of these issues. The issue in the case, he says, was generally understood as being whether Quebec judges on the federal courts were sufficiently familiar with civil, civil law and connected with Quebec's social values to be eligible to fill a Quebec seat on the Supreme Court. And here is his response. He notes that the Federal Courts Act, just like the Supreme Court Act, reserves seats for jurists trained in Quebec civil law, and for the very same reason, ensuring the representation of Quebec and of the civil law on our courts. He notes the Quebec National Assembly recognizes in Section 24 of the Code of Civil Procedure that the federal courts have jurisdiction in civil matters in Quebec, including not only traditional civil law, but also modern civil law outside the boundaries of the civil code. He says that in my, since my appointment in 1992, he has witnessed the federal courts applying civil law in civil liability, tort liability, construction of contracts, limitation, easements, sales, property rights. He lists about 25 others. So he says, how can one explain to a Quebec candidate approached to fill a vacancy in our court that he will be appointed for his civil law training and as a representative of Quebec but that he, and I'll substitute, or she, will be deemed to no longer have those qualities under the Supreme Court Act from the moment he's sworn in. How to explain in the same vein that having been a member of the Quebec Bar for over 10 years, he qualifies as a potential appointee to the Supreme Court, but that he will lose that possibility from the moment he becomes a member of our court. I think he makes a very telling point here. The notion that this is going to be uh, salubrious for, for national unity, that we've averted some kind of national unity crisis yet again by the wise and far-seeing intercession of the Supreme Court, which I suspect was possibly inter influencing their thinking here, that we didn't want to create another uh, bust-up uh, with Quebec nationalists, is only by essentially conceding uh, the, the terms of debate to them, that by the terrible crime of having gone to the federal court, a Quebec jurist is no longer in touch with Quebec, is no longer familiar with Quebec civil law, is no longer really a Quebecer, I think is the, really the undertone of this. Uh, I don't think we should be conceding that in political terms. I certainly don't think the Supreme Court should have been uh, bending over backwards to make that point. I think all in all, uh, it was a calamitous decision both as law, both as a reflection of the actual versus the pretended historical record, and in terms of its consequences. But I'll just close by saying, I think ultimately a large share of the blame uh, for this extends back to, these, to the federal government. Judge Nadon, I don't think, should have been put in this position, should not have been put through this indignity. The court should not have been put in this position. The country should not have been put in this position. If ever there were an argument for a more robust view, review process of legislative review of such appointments, because there was supposed to be a process here and it clearly did not raise some of the red flags that it might have. Uh, it seems to me this is this. As with other recent controversies, as, as including the Senate scandals, et cetera, it isn't a matter just of the Prime Minister's judgment, but of a system that trusts so much to one person's discretion. Thank you very much. So as Andrew said, uh, initially I prepped for a slightly different panel. Um, I was asked to speak to the reference uh, regarding the Supreme Court Act, focusing on the Quebec requirement, but I will indulge in some broader observations. And you will see that my prepared remarks contain some implicit replies uh, to Andrew, but rather than making it up on the fly, which would be painful for all involved, I'm just going to proceed through my remarks. Yeah. 
Um, so 2014 put me in mind of that old Chinese curse, uh, may you live in interesting times. Uh, certainly I didn't think that I would be spending much of the academic year combing through the 1875 Hansards or embroiled in intense debate about the meaning of the French word palmi. And speaking of that, um, I noticed yesterday before the excellent debate over assisted suicide, uh, the moderator, Derek, I believe, acknowledged the sensitivity of the issue and requested that the questions be respectful. So, Marnie, I'm shocked that you didn't issue the same caution for this <laughs> panel. It's 9 a.m. on a Saturday. What could be more likely to inflame your passions than the Supreme Court Act? I mean, I, just saying. So the appointment of Justice Mark Nadeau raised a question of first impression, which is always very exciting for academics. Um, what are the precise limits on the appointment power contained in Section 6 of the Supreme Court Act? And as Andrew has outlined, unlike Section 5, uh, which permits the appointment of a member of a superior court or a member of the bar for 10 years, whether current or past, Section 6 further requires that three of the court's nine seats be appointed from persons serving as judges on the equivalent Quebec courts or from among the advocates of that province. Now, past practice suggested that Section 6 was understood to confine appointments to either judges on specified Quebec courts or to current members of its bar. And in particular, although several judges have been appointed to the Supreme Court from the federal court, none proceeded under Section 6. And this included at least one judge, Gerald Ledin, who was trained in Quebec. Justice Nadeau's appointment was, of course, challenged in federal court. The government responded in two ways. First, it got declaratory legislation passed to ensure that sections five and six would be interpreted as having always included candidates with past bar membership. And second, it referred the entire matter to the Supreme Court. Now, as Andrew has said, it's true that many questioned the government's choice of Justice Nadeau in the first place. Given the depth of the pool in, in Quebec, the selection of a supernumerary judge from the federal court was, to say the least, curious. It is important, though, to separate any evaluation of Judge Justice Nadeau's qualifications from his legal el eligibility, and certainly I won't be getting into the latter, excuse me, the former issue. Justice Nadeau's nomination was accompanied by a memorandum written by retired Justice Ian Binney. Justice Binney briefly canvassed the issue and concluded that there was no statutory impediment to the appointment. And to be completely frank, my first reaction to the memo was, yeah, that sounds about right. Like most scholars, I didn't think there was much of an issue around appointing federal court judges, particularly given the prior appointments of people like Le Dain and Frank Iacobucci. Then Professor Michael Plaxton and I decided to take a closer look at the issue, and shortly thereafter we published an article that uh, agreed with Justice Binney's analysis of Section 5, but not Section 6. It was not, in our view, appropriate to treat Section 6 as effectively identical to Section 5, but simply inserting the words from Quebec. Section 5 exists to guarantee minimal legal expertise for the court as a whole, but the purpose of Section 6 is to set out specific rules to guarantee expertise with respect to Quebec's legal tradition. Our research also suggested that the relevant legislators over a period of many decades were aware of specific concerns in Quebec regarding the court and sought to assure Quebec in a deeper sense of the legitimacy of its candidates. And we concluded that a narrower construction of the eligibility requirement, one which requires current bar membership, was the correct interpretation. Agreeing with this line of argument, a six to one majority of the court advised that the appointment was void ab initio. It held further that by effecting constitutional change through the back door, the declaratory legislation was ultra vires. I'm not going to address the amendment detail uh, issue in detail in these remarks, but I'm certainly happy to speak to it in questions. Now, Michael Plaxton and I always acknowledged that the interpretive issue was close. It was gratifying on Friday to hear Justice Binney describe the choice as between reasonable alternatives. Until the Supreme Court issued its opinion, uh, that wasn't often a response we got, including from our closest friends. <laughs> Why was this the case? Well, let me now address two frequent critiques made against our reading of Section 6. The argument from, from absurdity and the sky has fallen argument, or if you will, the argument from unintended consequences. The argument from absurdity is that the restrictive interpretation of Section 6 leads to such wildly counterintuitive results the Parliament could not have possibly intended it. I'll illustrate with a quote from Justice Binney's memorandum. <clears throat> 
Parliament's obvious concern in sections five and six was to exclude from consideration men and women who lack the appropriate skills and experience. Exclusion from possible appointment of the talent pool of federal court judges conflicts with this purpose. Take, for example, a lawyer who practices for 15 years in Montreal from 1970 to 1985, then sits as a judge on the Federal Court of Appeal from 1986 to 2000. Such an individual is clearly better qualified in 2000, after 14 years on the bench, than he was in 1985 prior to the initial appointment. Yet, the objection to the appointment of federal court judges attributes to Parliament the view that federal court experience is a detriment, not an asset. Any interpretation of sections five and six of the Supreme Court of Canada Act that leads to such an absurd result should be rejected. Now, a linchpin of any argument from absurdity is how it actually defines what counts as absurd. In this case, the purported absurdity arises from the exclusion of people who would be competent to perform the task of a Quebec judge. Critics argue that a Quebec-trained jurist who happens to sit on a court outside of that province is not by virtue of that fact alone less competent to represent Quebec on the Supreme Court. That's entirely reasonable, but it entirely misses the point. This is because neither Section 5 nor Section 6 are crafted chiefly to ensure that all competent persons will be considered or that the best person will always get the nod. Rather, they assert rules that can be applied predictably to limit the pool of candidates. Think of it this way. Were excellence in civil law the true threshold for Section 6, there would be no need to confine its candidates to those who are or have ever been advocates in Quebec. Bar admission provides, at most, a proxy for competence. Similarly, were excellence in the law generally the true threshold for Section 5, there would be no reason to limit it to candidates with 10 years bar membership. Again, length of time functions as a proxy rather than the sole and most obvious indicator of excellence. In other words, there are no doubt excellent candidates who could fulfill the functional role of a Supreme Court judge who are excluded by a plain reading of the sections. Their exclusion does not prove that such a reading is absurd. It might do so if it could be shown that the legislature intended that all competent candidates be considered and that the most competent one be chosen. But there is no evidence that this is the case. The second problem with the argument flows from the first. The absurdity critique imputes to Parliament a negative, even derogatory, assessment of the federal court. In the quote I just read, for example, we find the statement, the objection to the appointment of federal court judges attributes to Parliament the view that federal court experience is a detriment, not an asset. Well, it's true. Were Parliament to actually hold such a view, it might well be uninformed. But it has never been suggested, let alone persuasively argued, that Parliament is thereby foreclosed from holding such a view. Is there, in fact, only one proper view of the matter? As stated, the argument almost seems to dare people to impugn the federal court. I take no position on this, except to note that uncomfortable conclusions are not in themselves a reason to disregard statutory language or legislative history. Consider that the same argument has been made with respect to provincial court judges. Both sections five and six clearly enumerate superior, not inferior courts. Yet before the reference, I recall zero advocates pressing for the express inclusion of provincial court judges. As far as I can tell, their exclusion has never been an issue. Now, that response may seem harsh, even impolitic. Happily, there is a much softer one. The restrictive reading of section six simply does not imply a negative assessment of those whom it excludes. In our paper, Michael and I noted that rules can function as heuristic devices. They can achieve an underlying goal indirectly rather than directly. In this case, the rule functions to cabin the pool of candidates to, do, to those thought likely to possess the necessary competence and legitimacy. Like a voting age rule that bypasses the need to individually assess citizens for sufficient maturity, the currency rule avoids having to individually assess particular candidates for their link to Quebec society.
So the argument from absurdity ignores one legislative reading in favor of another that supports what its advocates clearly see as a better outcome. To be sure, requiring that Section 6 candidates be current members of the bar is not the only way to respond to the concern that Quebec judges be sufficiently connected to that province. It may not even be a particularly good or comprehensive way. Our argument was simply that it is the method that the legislation, history, and past practice appear most clearly to support. Because I have never disputed that both interpretations were reasonable, I want to address the other critique of our reading, which is that it leads to undesirable consequences, and for that reason should have been rejected. Critics state that Quebec is being cheated of the fullest complement of judges. The argument becomes even more impassioned when it turns to the federal court. The court is seen as denigrated. Its judges described as having become second-class citizens. The Minister of Justice before Parliament said the restrictive interpretation was potentially discriminatory. Concern has also been expressed that Quebec lawyers will be dissuaded from accepting nominations to sit on the federal court, leading to a decline in quality on that bench. That the Supreme Court not only adopted the restrictive interpretation, but doubled down by constitutionally entrenching it, no doubt intensifies the critique. The argument that Quebec is not getting the benefits of the fullest complement of competent judges, of civilists, might be true, but that applies to all of the limiting rules, not just the currency requirement. And unlike, say, the tenure rule, the currency requirement only applies to appointments made under Section 6. An outstanding, once-in-a-generation civilist, or Quebecer indeed, <laughs> who meets the other criteria, can be appointed under Section 5. They could follow the path of a Justice Arbour, or Justice Le Dain. I don't mean to suggest that either of those judges were appointed for that purpose, only to say that the route to the court is not necessarily foreclosed. The arguments that have been made by and on behalf of the federal court and its judges are clearly sincere. But preventing bad feeling on the part of certain individuals is not an adequate reason for construing any legislation, let alone the governing framework of a court of final appeal. Finally, the argument that people will avoid sitting on the federal court in order to maintain their eligibility for a Supreme Court career seems divorced from reality. The chances of any one individual getting a Supreme Court nod are akin to winning the lottery. These are generational occurrences featuring so many different considerations that the individuals who would hold out for such an appointment surely must be in the extreme minority and frankly, I would say the idea that such blatantly careerist considerations would affect whether a jurist would accept a federal court, court appointment is actually a little disconcerting. I don't mean to suggest that self-interest doesn't play a role, but the fact that such a person might be dissuaded from joining the federal court is not, in my view, a sensible argument in favor <laughs> of, of a particular interpretation of Section 6. In fact, we know very little about who actually applies to the federal court, even how many do. Those statistics are not made available. But it seems unremarkable that many different factors would feed into such a choice and that the position with its independence, security of tenure, generous compensation would not hold plenty of attraction. I'll end with this. Reasonable people can disagree about whether, as an interpretive matter, Section 6 included or excluded Justice Nadeau. Reasonable people can also disagree on the underlying policy of ensuring legitimacy as well as technical competence when filling the three seats reserved under Section 6. Some people, though, have insisted there is only one in reasonable interpretation. Justice Nadon was always qualified, eligible, excuse me. In my opinion, this resistance to even consider alternative arguments, the jump to characterize them as absurd, suggests that we no longer are really dealing in an interpretive issue, but in passionate advocacy in favor of what the law should say. But the focus needs to be foremost on what the law does say. Ironically, this was an interpretive approach that Justice Nadeau himself strongly advocated at his parliamentary appearance. The Supreme Court agreed, and I think it was correct to do so. Thank you. I don't know whether I have five minutes of material to rebut here or not, but uh, let me start by saying that we're certainly agreed on the last point, that the issue here should be what, not what the law should say, uh, but what the law does say. 
what I heard from Professor Mathen was two arguments that uh, I actually have no problem accepting it because I don't think they really address the points that I was making. So yes, the mere argument of absurdity, I think, does not suffice to reject the Supreme Court's reasoning. Uh, I, I agree with the professor that the, nothing in the statute obliges the, the best or most excellent candidate to be appointed, and we should not be judging the ruling uh, based on whether or not we're going to get the best candidate or not. Uh, I agree also that unintended consequences alone are not sufficient if we're talking about law rather than uh, larger political ramifications, although I'm a little disconcerted at the, the apparent blindness of saying, well, judges from Quebec who want to be appointed to the Supreme Court can leave the province and go through the, uh, the federal court from some other province. That seems to be a bit, bit much to ask, but again, perhaps that's neither here nor there. But I don't think anything that I heard addressed the nub of the arguments that I was making. Particularly, it seems to me the two issues that really come down to this is, one is, are we reading Section 5 and 6 together or not? If we are, as I su su submit is the more rational way to approach it, then we have a hard time explaining, still, why the current or former rule in Section 5 somehow gets boiled down to just current in Section 6 without any explicit instruction as to why, in, in the statute as to why that would be the case. If Parliament intended that, I repeat the point, why didn't it say so? Why was it left to, to uh, future generations to conjure up? And it doesn't get us out of this conundrum. I mean, you can call it absurdity, or you can just call it um, consistent reasoning that, the, that if the currency law principle was applied on its own, if we read Section 6 in splendid isolation from Section 5, if we just said currency, it does mean you appoint somebody who's been applied for just one day. Now, the court saw the danger in that and attempted to wriggle out of it by saying, well, no, of course, the 10-year rule from Section 5 would apply. It has not been explained to me why we can, in good conscience, pick out bits of Section 5 that we like to apply to Section 6, but ignore the parts that we find inconvenient when applying to Section 6. So I think that textual reading problem is still unaddressed uh, after Pro Professor Mathen's uh, uh, presentation. And secondly, the, lar the larger thing I think, whether this is statutory or not, that, that you want to address is this larger question of, do members of the, of the federal court from Quebec adequately represent Quebec. If the larger question here beyond the statute is we want to ensure that the, that the members of the, of the Supreme Court from Quebec are seen to have legitimacy in Quebec, then surely one of the questions is are they adequately versed in the civil law? Do they have experience in applying it? Are they fulfilling that function? Uh, I have not seen an argument, uh, certainly, as to why that would be the case. Uh, uh, it's just been sort of glossed over, it seems to me. If we think, as with the Chief Justice of the Federal Court of Appeal, that they are, in fact, well-versed in the civil law. That's why they're appointed. That's one of the criteria by which they are uh, appointed to the federal court. Uh, then it's hard-pressed to me to see why we would exclude them, especially since we have no clear injunction from the statute to do so, why we would exclude them from consideration for the nation's highest court. Thank you very much. The isolation point. Uh Nobody's suggesting to read Section 6 as though it's a completely standalone provision. Certainly I, I'm not. There are clearly linkages between Section 6 and Section 5. But on the point where the statutory language diverges, uh, that's the point about the currency issue. The tenure membership was never a point of divergence, ten years bar being the, 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 the proxy for competence. The currency was a point of divergence, and the Supreme Court actually detailed this in a number of, in a number of uh, going through a number of the uh, derivations and uh, different iterations of the Supreme Court Act over the years. And I would just note that the, if you want to call it odd treatment of the federal court, was continued as recently as 2002 when the Supreme Court, in its treatment of the ad hoc judges rule, maintained this distinction for uh, which courts are eligible to supply ad hoc judges under Section 5 or Section 6. Now, and as the Supreme Court said, Section 5 is the general rule, but Section 6 is the more restrictive one. And in interpreting those restrictions, our argument was that the currency issue was relevant and corresponded with, additionally, past practice. I mean, this is 40 years of federal court appointments, none of whom proceeded under Section 6. Second point, which again, I think I did address in terms of the issue, in terms of the statutory interpretation, is not who would be competent to represent Quebec. I don't actually quarrel with the fact that a federal court judge could competently represent Quebec, but 
if Section 6 does not uh, permit that, then you have a statutory barrier, which is all that we were arguing. Um, the, in terms of how such a person could proceed to the court, as I've said, there is still a route through Section 5 if one, thing that's, one thinks that's very important. And there has been precedent in terms of Quebec trained jurists, civilists, proceeding to the court uh, under that route. Thank you. Okay, well we, as always, are gonna open it up for questions and I'd ask that if anyone has a question, they'd come up. I just wanted to, before we get to that, I, I realized that I forgot an appointment, an important appointment of an uh, both eligible and qualified person in Andrew's intro, which is that Andrew's now the uh, heading up the comment section at the National Post. And I also wanted to clarify that um, Andrew is indeed standing in for Grant Huscroft on this panel, but um, was always on the program. So let's <laughs> just make sure that, uh, that is clear. Um, and finally, charisma is right. I'll ask that everyone be very respectful in this somber <laughs> topic so that we don't cause any offense. And with that, Jerry, if you want to just grab... Um, yeah, let me see if I can do a better job than yesterday of not twisting it about... I, I just wanted to, as someone who's practiced uh, before the Supreme Court for the last three decades, to say that, uh, with respect, I think that Justice Nadal was as qualified as any of the lawyers or judges who could have been appointed. Uh, so I just want to put that on the record. Um, I don't think that uh, I could have been more proud than if he had been appointed. So at least from my perspective, he was a great appointment. But I hope that a future prime minister, or the current one, will uh, break or cut this uh, Gordian knot by simply asking a future federal court judge to simply resign for a day, go back to Quebec, and be appointed. And I think that's probably the right answer for the future. In the reference, or in the reference decision, the court expressly refuses to address the issue, but I think they do because they know that that is an answer for a future Prime Minister. Well, the court didn't address that. I, Justice Binney actually did in his memorandum, and he said it would undermine the dignity of the institution. And I would also say that the uh, ramping up of the issues where it's now actually a, a constitutionally entrenched uh, rule uh, would make that kind of workaround more difficult, much more difficult. And my question is more for Professor Mathen, and it's sort of a, a a uh, question preceded by a comment. Um, I take a lot of your points, but my, my problem with your interpretation, I think, is that it runs, in my mind, completely contrary to accepted methods of statutory interpretation generally. First of all, you talked about how we need to have a, a strict interpretation, but it's well established that we don't interpret statutes except for penal statutes strictly, especially a constitutional text or a quasi-constitutional text, it's well established that we give them large liberal meanings, which should at least mean that we take the, the statute in its entire context. And that's especially true with a, a quasi-constitutional statute like the Supreme Court Act, because I agree with you, Parliament can't simply amend that act to clarify something. If, if the law was that you, uh, you can't be from the federal court if you're in Quebec, then that's the law, and that re would require a constitutional amendment. So I think it's very important that we don't interpret a statute like that strictly. And what I don't seem to understand is that on the one hand, you're talking about a strict interpretation. On the other hand, you're talking about accepted practices in Quebec, which has nothing to do with what the statute says. So you seem to be oscillating between one extreme to the other there. Uh, the other thing is, in terms of absurdity, the absurdity is not that someone from uh, the federal court who is from Quebec can't sit on the bench and that no one would have intended that. The, the absurdity is what we were just talking about, that you would be eligible if you stepped down for a day and then were appointed to the court. That would be consistent with the Supreme Court's reading. And that is a result that no reasonable person could have intended. And that's really the definition of an absurd result. Whatever your, your politics are, there's no way that anyone would have said, what we want to do is make sure that anyone from Quebec who goes to the federal court becomes a lawyer again for one day. No one would have ever thought that. 
And, and the third thing is there's a presumption of constitutionality, always when we interpret statutes. So I'm just wondering, in, in light of these very well accepted principles of statutory interpretation, you yourself admitted that this was, a, this was an ambiguous case. It could have gone either way. How does that ambiguity not resolve in favor of the government in light of all these accepted principles of interpretation? Okay, well, you've said a lot. I will try to uh, respond. I don't believe in my remarks I use the word strict. I'm going to quote Antonin Scalia. I don't think statutes should be constru construed strictly. I don't think they should be construed leniently. I think they should be construed reasonably. Uh, large liberal interpretation, what does that mean? Right? It really depends on the perspective in terms of what you think the role of the court is and what you think the role of the legislators were over successive parliaments in making a number of changes to the act. Accepted practices, I was not referring to Quebec, I was referring to previous prime ministers and their un largely unfettered discretion to appoint judges under sections five and six and the route that they chose to select judges from the federal court. So not practices in Quebec, practices at the federal executive level. And uh, the, argument from, the argument that you raised about the uh, absurd result that, that uh, a, a person could simply, how a person could get around a rule. Many rules at their margins, right, when you're faced with actually applying the rule in the marginal case, there is that absurdity. At any point, a given rule, if you are trying to apply it predictably, you will run up against an interpretation that seems uh, unintuitive. Uh, that's, in a sense, the nature of rules-based enactments. And the issue is, at what, is, what are you going to do to try and get around the rule? Now, when I wrote my paper, I was not approaching it as a constitutional issue. I was approaching it as a statutory issue. And I said, amend the statute, right? The government was, for whatever reason, absolutely opposed to amending the statute. They used this extraordinary power, the declaratory power, to try and say that it had always been read this way. I mean, there's some really interesting underlying issues as to why they approached it the way that they did. But my, my uh, position from the outset, absent the part five issue, was amend the statute. Don't try and get around the rule in the way that you have. I, d I don't want to repeat previous points I made. I'll just add this one on, on this question of uh, past practice. I, I just don't think past practice can or should inform our reading of the text one way or the other. It's, it may have been the case that previous court appointments have not come from the federal court of Quebec, or federal court in Quebec, federal court judges in Quebec, but I don't think that informs uh, one way or the other the text. Well, just to amplify what I'm meaning is that that supports the plain reading of the difference between section five and section six. Okay, thank you. How you define plain reading. <laughs> Morning, I'd like to thank you both very much for a very interesting, uh, respectful and passionate presentation. Um, brief comment that my question has largely been addressed, but I'm gonna put a different spin on it. But brief comment, preface to that. In the case of both Justice Ledin and Justice Arbour, they had built at least the parts of their careers immediately before they were judges in Ontario. Um, so they naturally seemed to be fitting Ontario seats. And I'm not sure there was truly sufficient practice to determine this federal court judges from Quebec one way or the other. My question, I guess, is for Professor Mathen, but uh, Mr. Quinn, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it. If the government had done what they apparently had thought they were going to do, which was appoint Justice Nadon to the Superior Court or send him back to the bar for a day. Um, my colleagues suggested that's absurd. Um, and you said, well, rules on the margin can lead to some absurd results. Well, wouldn't the better way to approach it to be interpret the rule to avoid any sort of absurdity, we wouldn't have to say, all right, you are a former advocate for tenure standing, you're eligible, we wouldn't have to deal with these sort of dance rounds, which I agree after the case would be politically imprudent anyways, um, but wouldn't that just be more sensible construal of the rule to begin with? Well, I don't think that the most, that uh, we should adopt a particular construal of the rule to, so that the party which wants to, uh, which wants 
to pr undertake an action which appears to be in conflict with the rule is faced with having to, uh, to resort to unorthodox means to do that. I, I don't think that that's a, a sensible way to, or really a, a reasonable consideration to take into account into construing the rule. But I must also say that the argument from absurdity works, works both ways because if uh, currency doesn't matter, then you can have a, a person who perhaps was a member of the Quebec Bar for many years, but is now in Vancouver, has been there for 30 years, ensconced in the common law system. Apparently they're eligible under Section 6. So the, the argument in terms of the unintended consequences and the, the, the uh, counterintuitive results, really, it works both ways, and it really just depends on which uh, side of the argument do you emphasize. Is it the distinctiveness question? Why does Section 6 actually exist? Or is it the we want to have the most, uh, th to give the broadest latitude of appointments to the executive when they're appointing uh, judges who uh, are, have some connection to Quebec? Absurdity is not enough on its own to convict, but if we're trying to think about what did Parliament mean uh, when it passed legislation, uh, if the implication of one way of thinking about this is that you could appoint somebody for a day, uh, or who had, who had served for a day, uh, that I submit is an even greater absurdity than you could appoint somebody who had theoretically, theoretically had gone to live in BC. Um, they both have some, somewhat disquieting implications, but if we're agreed that, that the, there's no necessity in the law that we appoint the absolute best judge, that there are going to be ways in which a determined uh, federal government could appoint somebody less than optimal in either construction of the text, I nevertheless submit the currency has the greater absurdity. The one-day possibility cannot possibly have been what Parliament intended. And it certainly helps to me, it certainly to me comports with the idea that when Parliament laid down the general rule of eligibility for a province, not a province other than Quebec, but for a province, and when it said that general rule of eligibility was current or former, and when it then said what was clearly the, the intent of that Section 6, which was to say we're going to have three judges from Quebec, when it failed to say in that legislation they also have to be current members of the bar, when it left that question open, it just seems to me the most reasonable interpretation is the limitation in Section 6 is not about current or former, it's about three judges being from Quebec. The general rule of eligibility of current or former is the overriding uh, criteria, it seems to me. Um, you've both thought deeply on this judgment. I'm interested in your views on a possible future implication of the judgment. And that is the question of, given the way in which the court suddenly constitutionalized very specific rules about the composition of the court and uh, eligibility for the court, does this judgment bear on uh, future attempts to amend the Supreme Court Act to impose a rigid bilingualism requirement on the judges, uh, such as to require that to be via a constitutional amendment rather than through a statutory amendment, uh, because that gets constantly discussed in some quarters, and I'd be interested in uh, both of your thoughts on that. I think it does. I think it absolutely does. And I go on the record. I said this before the Senate. I would not have answered the, the Part 5 question in quite the way that they did. Uh, you know, I think there's force in the idea that the fact that, 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 that the Supreme Court is, is mentioned in the amending formula means something rather than not. That, this, that it's not just uh, that the amending formula's references to Section 6 or uh, to the Supreme Court Act are not just an empty vessel that will be filled for future amendment. That being said, I think that the qualifications part of Section 6 uh, and Section 5 is uh, a very uh, big problem if you want to make changes uh, to the court to uh, have it better reflect certain, certain uh, interests. And um, I would just note that certainly post-1982, there have been a number of changes to the Supreme Court Act in a number of ways that has affected the jurisdiction of the court, uh, what the kinds of powers it can have, and it's, it's a little bit disconcerting to think that all of those were made through ordinary legislation, but as of this moment, it's all off the table. So I, I don't actually, I'm not entirely, I was not persuaded, I have to say, although I supported the statutory argument, not still not persuaded by some of the uh, choices that they made around Section five, Part 5. Uh, uh, I will say I think it is one of the happier consequences, having said some of the negative consequences, that it probably does rule out uh, 
imposing a uh, bilingualism requirement on future appointments, which I think is a very good thing. I think it would be calamitous if we were to go down that road, not only for the quality of the court, uh, but for um, national unity. If you want to talk about things that would cause enormous cleavages in this country, uh, it would be effectively ruling out uh, members of, of the bench from, from Western Canada uh, for the Supreme Court, because that is effectively what it would mean. Uh, we really, I don't think, want to go down that road. I, I suppose what I have to say is more of a comment than a question. I, uh, I appear before the, the federal courts, and I think one of the things that's kind of gone unmentioned is the fact that perhaps federal court judges aren't as competent as their um, <laughs> provincial court uh, appointees. And I say that because the federal court... Are there any federal court judges here, by the way? <laughs> None I've appeared before. Bless so your heart. <laughs> now, well, exactly. Yeah, so I'm getting there. So the... <laughs> the um, <laughs> so the, the Federal Courts Act was created to deal with certain federal court matters, um, as opposed to the provincial uh, courts, which obviously are constitutional, which are courts of uh, original and inherent jurisdiction that deal with all sorts of uh, every, every law that may arise. So it seems to me that on the face of it, there, and by federal matters, just for the non-lawyers, I mean, we're talking about income tax, we're talking about taxes generally, EI, CPP, maritime, admiralty, um, court martial, that sort of thing that goes to, the, goes to the federal court and then the federal court of appeal, some of them directly. So it appears to me that you know, on the face of it, a judge from a provincial court is going to be uh, more in touch with specific values that are dealt with um, uh, all the time. And so specifically with Quebec, so therefore excluding a Justice Rothstein who is from Manitoba, it, um, it is important that they are on the bench dealing with those laws and those specific things on a daily basis. So whereas, you know, I, I don't like judicial activism and all that, there is an argument to be said that perhaps um, provincial court judges do have a level of competency over and above their federal court counterparts. And, uh, you know, that being said, I won't comment that some of the decisions of the Federal Court of Appeal on a charities context are international embarrassments, which is a total separate comment on competency. But there is, there is something that, to be said there. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that, it was just a comment, not necessarily uh, uh, a question. Again, I would quote the, the uh, Chief Justice of the Federal Court of Appeal, who says, that, you know, yeah, they apply federal law, they also apply civil law, or certainly consider it. We are no different in this respect from the judges of the Quebec Court of Appeal or the Quebec Superior Court who apply the Criminal Code, the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, and the other various federal statutes that they are called upon to apply. So if we're talking about appointing somebody to a national court, the Supreme Court, uh, I don't see at all how your argument holds water that somebody who's, who's from the provincial court is going to be necessarily better qualified to represent Quebec. I don't see that argument as holding at all.